today we're going to be talking about circular motion. And with circular motion, you've probably heard of these words, rotation and revolution. Rotation is just an object spinning on its internal axis. We see it all the time. For toys, like the little toy that's called a top, when you spin it, it is rotating on itself, on its little axis. The Earth is a larger example, which spins on its axis, causing day and night for us. And for an example, ice skater, an ice skater twirling, that is an example of rotation. Now, an axis is that straight line through which the rotation takes place. Revolution is, the, is different from rotation in that it is when an object turns about an external axis. So, for example, the Earth traveling around the Sun, the Sun being the external axis or the center point. So it's almost as if the object is traveling around another object or the center of something else. Now, how does the Earth revolve? So here we already talked about rotation, and this is spinning on its one axis, right? Revolution is where you are spinning around another center, so an external axis. It is not within the object itself. Here is another example of rotation. So the record is spinning on with its center axis right there, okay? Now, when we talk about rotation and revolution, we are discussing speed, okay? So there is, we, we already know what linear speed is. We've learned this. We know that it is the distance that is covered or traveled per whatever amount of time, right? So whatever unit of time you traveled a certain distance. When we're talking about rotation and revolution, we are talking about, we call this tra tangential speed, okay? It is also known as linear speed, because it is a certain amount of speed that you are experiencing while you are traveling on a circular path. And it is a straight line, it's the straight line part. It's the part that is a straight line that an object would take if it flew off of a circle. So for example, down here, you're seeing that an object is going around and inertia, if it was not in the circle, it would actually go in this direction, okay? For example, if the object was going around this circle over here, you would see that it could fly off at any of these moments because this is what inertia wants it to do. This is what it thinks it's traveling, but it's being pulled in for some reason into the center. So for example, going backwards to this area, the Earth is going around the Sun, but the Earth is actually traveling in a straight line. It thinks it is, but the gravity of the Sun is pulling it so that it continuously thinks it's going straight, but it's actually changing directions because it's being pulled in by the gravity. And this is what causes orbits. One other thing to write down here is that farther from the center, so the further out that you go from the center, the greater your speed is. Let me show you an example. So here we have an object and there are three points. Okay, So there is point A, point B, and point, point C respectively. A being the closest to the center, B being the furthest. They all have the same revolutions, which means that all the points complete one revolution, one cycle, at the same time. Let's say one revolution takes one second. So point A, right over here, would go around in one second. Point B would also go around in one full second. C would also go around all in one second. But do you notice that the radius or the diameter, the amount of distance that point A will travel, will probably be less than what B would travel and what C would travel. So let's take a look. The distance covered by point A, let's say it's uh, one meter. Okay, so let's say that this, this circle track that point A is going to be traveling is one meter. If you were to take one meter and you divide that by one second, you would get a speed of one meter per second. 
you do this for the rest of them and you know that point B covers three meters in one second. So you just divide that by one second and you get a speed of three meters per second. For point C, it's seven meters per second. So as you can see, the further out that you go, covering different amounts of distances will therefore increase your speed. Now, we call it tangential. Tangential speed, and you're probably wondering, what is a tangent? So a tangent is just a line that touches the edge of a point anywhere along the circular path. It always forms a 90 degree angle to the radius of the circle. So for example here, here is my line that we call a tangent that is going right at a point along the circular path. And it creates a 90 degree angle with the radius of the circle. Here is another example where you have the tangent in the blue and then the black line is the radius and it creates another right triangle or right angle. Here it is again with the right angle and here it is again with the right angle. So this is just showing that as the object is spinning that you have various directions that, the, that this point is traveling on. Now rotational speed. Rotational speed is also known as angular speed and it is denoted by this symbol here. It is the number of rotations per unit time or revolutions. So if you've heard of RPM, RPM stands for revolutions per minute. Examples of RPM are a CD. So when you put the CD into the CD player, it could be anywhere from 480 RPMs when you're reading at the innermost edge near the center, and it could go all the way to 210 revolutions per minute at the outer edge. A washing machine can rotate depending on whether or not you're on a spin cycle or if it's just starting. So it can actually vary from 500 to 2000 RPMs. So that means that this thing is going around quite fast per minute depending on what cycle you're in. There is a relationship between tangential speed and rotational speed. And this is what it looks like. It's saying that the speed, which is denoted by the letter V, and if you think kind of like velocity, that's where the speed comes in. And so T stands for tangential. So you have V sub T equals the R, which is the radial distance. So uh, if you remember, a circle has a diameter. A diameter is just half of the radius. or, or Wait a minute. The diameter is twice the length of the radius, so the radius is half the diameter. And then this right here, I believe, is omega, and that is the rotational speed, and it is in meters per second. A golfer's angular speed is 6.3 radians per second for his swing. He has two drivers and he wants to find the tangential speed for each driver so that he can decide which will hit the ball further. So one of the drivers or the golf clubs is 1.9 meters long from his axis of rotation. So think of 1.9 meters long this way and the other one is 0.2 meters shorter so it's 1.7 meters. So in order to find the tangential speed of each driver all you need to do is use our nifty little equation over here and plug everything in. Okay, so what you would get, and you can go ahead and stop the video and try to figure this out. So you'll be using the driver number one and plug that in with the speed to get the tangential speed. And then you'll be taking the 1.7 meters and plugging that in with the 6.3 and go ahead and hit play when you're ready to check your answer. Your answers should be for the first driver at 1.9 meters, you would get a tangential speed of 12 meters per second. That means that if you use this driver that you will be able to hit a ball 12 meters per second or you should be able to hit it at a speed of 12 meters per second. For the second driver, you would get a speed of 11, point, 11 meters per second. So from just comparing these two drivers, you will be able to see that the first or the longer driver is going to be able to hit the ball further. 
Now, centripetal force, when we're talking about circular motion, everyone always thinks of this. So centripetal force, what is it? It is a force that's directed to a fixed center. It causes an object to follow a circular path. And remember, it always creates that right angle with the radius. It means toward the center or center seeking. So if you look in this picture right down here, you'll see the radius here. This is the direction of the, the force. So it pulls the object into the center. Now with this, you're going to notice that the velocity can have constant speed, but the direction is always changing. So let's take a look over here and you notice that there's an object that's traveling and its inertia is going to want it to keep going in a straight direction, but it gets pulled for some reason either by gravity or tension or electrical forces. And if they did not exist, then this object would just fly off fly off at any of these directions depending on where it is when the force is no longer there. So because we know that acceleration happens when there is either a change in speed or a change in direction, velocity can be constant speed, but because that the direction is always changing, we are experiencing constant acceleration. It is always accelerating whenever you talk about centripetal force. The object is always accelerating. Without the force, the object would move in a straight line, and the net force, so we know what net force is, right? Net force is pretty much the total, the sum of all the forces, right? And the reason why we have an object moving around another object in a centripetal motion is because the net force is, is stronger inward. So there's more force that's going inward, which is keeping the object in its circular motion. An example is where gravity is holding a celestial body, right? So it's holding the moon in orbit around the Earth. So here we have the moon, and it wants to go in this direction, but it's getting yanked in by the gravity of the Earth. So therefore, it's in an orbit, okay? And we call this gravity. This is causing the centripetal force. Over here... If the Earth were to disappear, it would just go whoosh, and it would just fly off into space in whatever direction it thinks it's going. So inertia says it's going this way. If the Earth disappeared when the moon was traveling in this direction, then the moon would just go whoop, right off the page over here in this direction. If the moon was over here, it would go this way to the right. So as you can see, it just um, it's very theoretical, of course, but if the Earth were to disappear, then the moon would just continue going whichever direction it wants to go, which is what inertia is. Another example is electrical forces holding the electrons in an orbit around, this, around the nucleus. So you know that an atom has protons and electrons, and that protons are in the center, and they have a positive charge. Electrons are on the outside, and they're zipping all over the place, right? And... The only thing that's keeping the electron from just zipping off into nowhere and not being a part of the atom is that there is an attractive force, which we're calling here, it has a centripetal force, and it also has something else that we have not yet touched on, which is centrifugal force. And so therefore, this inward pull, this attraction is keeping the electron orbiting around the atom, the atom's nucleus. Now, in order to calculate centripetal force, all you need to know is that it is mass times speed squared divided by the radius of the curvature. And what that looks like is F sub C, C for centripetal, F for force, equals mass, which is in kilograms, and then velocity, or the speed, squared, which is meters per second, which would then turn into meters squared, second squared all over radius of the curvature, which is in meters. And we get that from looking at what the, the radius or the diameter is and then finding the calculation. When you figure all this out, you would get your answer in newtons. And remember that a newton is just a kilogram per meter per second squared. Let's do an example. So a ball is moving at 12.6 meters per second on a one point zero meter string. So you are twirling this string around. You're twirling the ball around on the string. 
How much force do you need if you were to make a 10 kilogram cannonball move in the same circle at the same speed? So you're gonna have the same radius, you're gonna have the same speed, but now you have a different mass. So all you need to do, here's our picture of showing a ball that is going in this direction here and getting swirled around, okay? So what you have here is F sub C, so this is centripetal force, equals MV squared over R. Plug everything in, this is your 10 kilograms. Your speed is 12.6 meters squared or meters per second squared all over the radius, which is 1.0, and you should get an answer of 1,590 newtons, which pretty much means you need about 1,590 newtons or 357 pounds of force in order to make a cannonball move in the same circle at the same speed. So it's going to take a lot more force to move a cannonball at the same speed as you are the, the little ball, the smaller ball. Here is another example. What is the centripetal force acting on a 100 kilogram person if he spun around in an 8 meter circle at a speed of 10 meters per second? So go ahead, use your equation that we've already used and try to calculate this answer before you start the video again. All right, so the answer is, let's plug everything in. So you have the centripetal force equals mv squared over r. Your answer should be 1250 newtons. Pretty easy, huh? All right, so the last thing that we need to talk about is centrifugal force. It is an outward force. It's that force that makes you feel like you're being pulled outside, like away from the center. It means center fleeing. It is the force that causes circular motion, but it is not a real force. So we'll talk about that in a second. But here we are with a person who is twirling something around him. Okay, so this object is feeling the tension, which is called the centripetal force, and it's also feeling the centrifugal force where the object is being pulled outward, as well as trying to be on its path of inertia. So here's an example. If you were to take a can, a tin can on a string, the string causes the circular motion. Without it, the can would just move straight, right? The way that it wants to go. If you were a bug inside of the can, you actually would get pushed to the outside of the can. You would be feeling centripetal force being pulled in on the can and then the centrifugal force of the, the little bug against the back or the bottom of the can. Now, if the circular motion were to stop, gravity is still there, but there would be no centrifugal forces. So this is why we call it not a true force. Okay, so that's all of our information. Be ready to use this and review the video again if anything is confusing.